Insurance is a very complicated business and is based upon trying to analyze risk. Mm. And um, just, I would say there is a continual need in the insurance business to just continually educate people on how insurance works, uh, to understand how, how, how the business operate. There are issues of the global insurance system. Really after Dodd-Frank, we, we become much more international than the way the insurance business operates. And so we get in conversations at the state level with global regulators who are concerned about how our system operates. Hello and welcome again to another episode of Sacktown Talks. Today, we're glad to be joined by Assemblymember Ken Cooley. Ken, thanks for joining us. How's it going? Good. You know, late in session. We all know how that is. Uh, everything about the town is heating up. You yeah. know, let's save conversations and the mercury too. Yeah, well, it's, it's kind of interesting because, you know, and I, we can kind of touch on this, but let's, I guess let's start a little bit with your background. So you're born in the Bay Area. You go to UC Berkeley. Uh, you graduate from Berkeley and you decide to go to law school and you came here to Sacramento. Yeah. Kind of what drew you here to Sacramento for law school if, after being in the Bay in that cool weather to want to come here to the hot Sacramento Valley? Yeah, well, there's a little wrinkle there because my first job out of Cal was mm -hmm. with Lou Pappen, who was the rules chair. Okay. So I actually came up here in 77 as his top staffer. And uh, I had never worked a day in the Capitol. I hadn't had an internship in the Capitol. Though my last year at Cal, I was an intern all year to the then president of the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, Diane Feinstein. <laughs> um, so uh, I came to work in Sacramento. And so I, I was here, married. Mm -hmm. And we by the time I started law school, we had our first child was not quite a year old. So I was just, I'd moved up here as a young guy, married, starting a family. And law school became what I thought would be good to develop my career. And as the breadwinner, night school was my option. So I was at McGeorge. So wait, wait. So you graduate from Berkeley and you immediately get a job as a, as a 22 year old as, as chief of staff to Lou Pat. Well, Lou, Lou's chief of staff, great guy, Rick Silver was in the district. Mm -hmm. So it's not right to say I was okay. chief of staff, but I was his top guy in the Capitol managing his bills. And Lou would have like 40 bills a year. I had a couple of district staff would sometimes manage a handful of bills, but I was one guy managing this vast legislative program for a leadership member. Right. Wow. So 1977, you come here to Sacramento. Yeah. You have a newborn, a new job, and you're going to night, night school, law school? Yeah. I didn't start the law school for a couple of years. That was the fall of 80. Okay. So Three. I did get my feet on the ground right. a little bit. And then decided, well, I, I can take more, uh, more of a punishing routine. Right. I'll be a night law student. Yeah, you had some free time. You thought, yeah, oh, right, exactly. You just take that up. Yeah. So, uh, 1977, I guess was, w Willie Brown was already speaker. Is that right? No, that was uh, my first speaker was Leo McCarthy. Okay. Yeah, Willie came in in '82. '82. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I my first speaker was Leo. Okay. So. And uh, Pappen was tight with Leo McCarthy. Right. So you were you were here, I guess, for one of the first seminal speaker fights. Uh, totally, yes. McCarthy and, and who was the other guy? The Berman, Howard Berman, Berman right? And Leo McCarthy, big fight. Um, <clears throat> Howard had what he thought was a majority in the Democratic caucus, mm -hmm. um, but the caucus was divided. So Howard thought he could have a majority in the caucus, and then that would bind the whole caucus to vote as a block, and they'd do it on the floor. That's not how it worked out. Right. And uh, eventually, of course, Willie became speaker once he put together uh, Assembly Democratic votes with the Republican caucus, then led by Ross Johnson. So, you know, he was like a, a third uh, out of nowhere, right? Willie kind of came. Yeah, well, the, the speakership of battle were... erupted in the fall of a year, and it didn't go anywhere. So then actually you had a, the ensuing year was election year. Mm hmm so Howard and McCarthy were running people in Democratic races, lining up their votes for that fall speakership right. in December. Um, and uh, 
That ended up being inconclusive. So now you have the institution vast turmoil. And so you got to find a way to kind of bring peace. Right. And Willie stepped into that space to try to be a reconciler. And in the course of that ended up, uh, things were not getting put together. So he found a path to 41. Right. Yeah. And that's what it's about. The path to 41. Path to 41. That was what it took. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that's a very yeah, remarkable time mm-hmm. in my career. I've lived that I'm one, I'm the only member today I think that's has worked on a successful veto override. AB 580, 1979, it was a policy building with subject matter insurance, which is a specialty of mine. And uh, Jerry had signed a bill the prior year, then it had a sunset. The bill was to remove the sunset. Jerry vetoed the lifting of the sunset. Pappen put his votes together. When it was all done and Jerry had been overridden on this policy issue, AB 580, and I was, as I say, staffer in the middle of all that. Uh, then chief of staff to, to uh, Jerry Gray Davis, who had been an army captain in Vietnam, uh, was asked, what was it like to be on the receiving end of a Lou Pappen veto override? <laughs> and uh, Gray Davis's rejoinder, great quip from a former army captain, he came at us like a heat-seeking missile, right. said Gray Davis. Yeah, you know, I... I've never had the chance to to meet Lou, but I've heard many stories, and he seemed to be quite a, a lively personality. Kind yeah, of. very dynamic. Right, yeah, right. Yeah, dynamic with a capital D. What was it and like it, working with him those years? Uh it was it was good. It was challenging. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was a very, I'll, I'll say, demanding boss, not unreasonably, but uh, he had big ambitions. And to support the sorts of things he wanted to do took a lot of work, a lot of creativity. Uh, and, you know, building a very collegial approach to work within the building. So I'm one guy. I had to work very close with all the committee staff, consult with them on what we're trying to do, get their advice. You know, I knew the deputies of the legislative council. I'd go back and forth with them on, they'd have questions, well, we're drafting it up. What do you think about this? I'd sort of have to figure out what right. I what I thought, you know, occasionally getting the boss's input, but really he he delegated a lot to me to just kind of get it done, you know. And so so you worked for Pappen from 77 to what, 80? 85, yes, okay. almost a full eight years. And that was remarkable. Um, Pappen was originally elected in the 74 fall elections. And by the fall of 76, he was done with his third staff person in the Capitol. He'd gone three guys. Right. Dan Howell used really? to work for him. Yeah. And Dan had a predecessor and a successor. Really? And so then I came to Lou when he had gone through three people in a handful of years. Mm-hmm. And we were together almost eight. Wow. So made, it, it was, made it work. Yeah, and so I guess through these eight years, I guess you took a interest in insurance and insurance policy and well, Pappen was an independent insurance agent. Mm-hmm. He was the rules chair, never chaired the policy committee, but his business was insurance. So consequently, it became my field because he was always in the mix on every insurance conversation, authored lots of bills, very influential on the committee. Um, and uh, yeah, so I just kind of, I got it by osmosis. And again, in those days, Alistair McAllister was the chair. The chief consultant was a guy named uh, Steve Spellman. There was another, Carl Brackensick, whom you probably know, longtime lobbyist, was on that committee. Another guy left long ago, Rich Mason. I worked with all of them. And um, so, yeah, you just, in these jobs, a, a lot of careers are built, I would say, in the legislative space because somebody starts out on an as an accidental bystander on an interesting <laughs> right. topic and they have no clue about it. But if you're the last man standing, last woman standing, right. you you know more than anyone else. So um, I did that with Lou for eight years after law school. I was out as counsel of the title insurance industry, which is a very tiny piece of the insurance industry. And then in 88, uh, the top lawyer for the insurance committee assembly retired and they went months without identifying someone to take on that role. 
And then of all things, uh, Jared, I was asked, would I be interested? Mm -hmm. And in those days, you know, I was actually a lobbyist, frequently appearing before the committee. Right. So it was one of those things like, well, I'm not going to go saunter up to the chair and say, I'm your guy. But if the chair wants to talk, if the chair ever wanted to talk, I would, of course, talk to the chair. And that's what happened. And who was the chair at that time? Uh, Patrick Johnston, Stockton. Uh, he and I met, I remember, at the National Hotel in Jackson. We just got off site a little bit. <laughs> and then uh, he was interested and then you know, had to be run up the Willie Brown flagpole. And uh, Steve Thompson was there in those days. There's plenty of people who knew me. Right. And so that got the thumbs up. And so that's did that. So how, and then you're there for how many years? And then eventually you go to the State Farm, is that right? Yeah, I left in 91. So I was just there a handful of years, but I was, I took us through Loma Prieta earthquake. I've actually done earthquake right. for many decades. I'm on the State Seismic Safety Commission. I was actually appointed by Schwarzenegger to sit on the Seismic Safety Commission originally. Uh, we had a workers' comp crisis in California, the state comp insurance fund in the 1980s which is the insurer right. of last resort, had like 75% of the market. That's what I want to talk to you. So 1987, right? Oh. We got the napkin and Frank Fats, mm -hmm. you know, the thing we read about in textbooks. Right. The infamous uh, <clears throat> workers' compensation uh, reform bill yeah. that was written on a napkin that still hangs in Frank Fats. Yeah. So I guess you were you were on the, the committee at that time, right? I was, yes, I was around at that time, yes. And was the napkin brought in to you to... Uh, Bring the ledge council. I to actually figure think. Out? I actually think probably when the bill got before the committee, mm -hmm. it was it was pulled out as an exhibit. Yeah, just because <laughs> it's you know entered into the lore of the institution already at that right. point. Yeah, yeah, good. And you know, I guess for for listeners who don't know, I guess can, can you kind of regale <laughs> us about the the famous napkin and how I guess the the details of the deal and kind of how it went down. Well, uh, workers' comp is extremely extremely complicated system. Um, it guarantees payment in the case of injuries. Guarantee with an asterisk. We know it takes time. It's very complicated. Right. But it's designed to assure that there's payment for workers if they're injured on the job. It involves insurance companies, health care providers, trial lawyers that specialize in workers' comp, businesses because they pay the premiums. It is like as complicated as any bit of legislation is, workers' comp is always like one of the top Rubik's Cubes right. to try to figure out. And it always involves a bunch of people uh, haggling out their views. Over many different industries, right? Yeah, across this whole right. span of industries, economic interests anyway. So late in session, they're all the, all the parties interested in the workers' comp and see if they could land this plane of a workers' comp deal in a time when the system was badly broken, uh, were hanging out at Frank Fats and and Willie and Lockyer was in the middle of that. Bill Lockyer eventually became our attorney general. Uh, and yeah, so they kind of took note of what were the terms on a, you know, classic Frank Fats linen right. napkin. You know, so a marker and a and kind of breaking down the pieces. Yeah, interesting. And Lockyer was in the the Senate at the time, right? Yes. So yeah, two houses coming together over yeah some good Chinese food. Yeah, like some good Chinese food. Eat. And it just brings us back to you know, for all the process, laws are basically ideas that acquire a following. Mm -hmm. You can have an idea; it can seem out there, but if people can sort of get around it, um, it can move. Right. And it, and on that point, it's like we are actually in a time of great division as a nation. Right. And, and so to say the legislative process is kind of, if you can reach agreement, you can come up with an idea. People don't even, not as sure they believe in that anymore. But as I remind people all the time, it's like, there's all, but almost no one who has any sort of leadership in their community whatsoever, but they're a part of a club, a service club, a church, a PTA or something that you read their bylaws. It says, in the event of an impasse, we will work things out according to Robert's rules of order. So really, our nation, everything we do as a nation, in clubs, service clubs, mm -hmm. churches, it's all founded upon this idea that different people have different views, and you have to have an orderly process to kind of work those out, make sure people get listened to, right? and we work it out. 
And that's actually how America does not just government, but it, everything it does is done around this fundamental idea that you got to get the sense of a group. And that can take work, whether in a PTA right. or the state Senate. Right. But once you do that, you can sort of move the community forward. Yeah. And I, I guess, you know, I guess it's been pretty interesting. And I guess that that's kind of been challenged or kind of put on its head kind of with, with COVID, right? We had this COVID crisis. Mm-hmm. And our usual ways of doing things have totally changed. Yeah, I agree with um, that. And you know, the legislature had to quickly adapt. Um, kind of as as rules chair, what was what was your involvement in kind of ensuring that people had, you know, access to public comment and information in a time where you know it was hard for people to congregate or actually go and and see their member? Well, we had to spend the money to, you know, when this whole thing started, the the idea of remote testimony was not something we typically did. Mm-hmm. Um, other states actually do this. Nevada does it. They'll convene hearings in Carson City and Clark County at the same time, and it all works out. We didn't have those systems in place. So it took a lot of figuring out what what platform are people going to use, how are we going to do right. it, buy the equipment, try to, try to have our technical staff understand how to operate it, find our technology partners to, to kind of help manage the queues and all that, do the best you can, uh, eventually figuring out a way to have an outside venue where someone could actually come up and stand and testify on the Capitol grounds if they wanted to do that, rather right. than just dialing in. Yeah, there's a, a lot of improvisation, a lot of intense, agonizing, heart stopping sometimes failure to scramble and find a put together a system to support public interaction. Right. And um and you sort of had to as rules chair both make sure it was supported with the resources it needed. So there's sort of a logistics thing. Right. But there's also that piece of you just got to tell your staff, do the best you can. And, and we just, we'll, we'll get through it and uh, create space where people who are trying to reinvent how our democracy works. If, if you had a bad day, if something didn't work, it's like, well, just take a deep breath. <laughs> we'll get there's always it. tomorrow. Yep. You know? Yeah. You know, you got to, we were very dependent upon tremendously capable people that the public would never see who are trying to their best in the trenches out of public view to put the systems together and operate them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think part of my job was to just make them feel like, thank you. Right. Thank you. You know, you're doing great. It's, you're not a conjurer. It takes work. It takes improvisation. It takes exploring what's going to work best. Just thank you. Just keep going. Yeah. You know, it's, it's kind of interesting, um, you know, to watch, you know, you know, your career, but you know, also oh. other, other staff who become members. Did you ever see yourself as a, in 1977 as a young staffer of being a member one day or, you know, when did you finally decide that, Hey, maybe I want to do this. Maybe I want to run for a Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, government always interested me. I'm very much, I say I'm sort of a, a geek that way. I, when I was eight, wrote a letter to John F. Kennedy. I mean, that's kind of weird. I still have the envelope. It it was, the return envelope wasn't signed by him, was addressed to Kenneth William Cooley, mm-hmm. which just tells you when you're eight and you write the president's like very serious right. business, use your whole darn name. But I did that at eight, 11, I followed the city manager of Las Vegas around for a day. 17, I had lunch with the city manager of Pacific Grove, studied poli sci at Cal. But I saw myself more in the realm of just trying to help us get to good ideas, you know. People of government make decisions, those decisions touch people. If you can improve the quality of that decision making, you touch people's lives. That seemed to be an awesome right. thing. So that was more how I approached it. But then I had the opportunity uh, in Rancho Cordova, where I've lived since 77, to enter into the conversation about cityhood, which I supported. And I actually walked door to door all over Rancho Cordova, explaining to people, threshold by threshold, why I felt cityhood would be good for our community. Mm-hmm. And then eventually put my hat in the ring as one of 21 candidates hoping for to end up in the top five to be on that first city council. So I would say it's only after I became elected in my own right. And um, I would say I did well. I. I did well at the city level. I got active with the League of Cities. 
you know, there's almost 500 cities in California. I'm one of thousands of council members. But I remember I got active around summer of 2004 in the League of Cities. I went to my first meeting. And by 2009, I was the statewide first vice president. I was due to be installed as president that fall. So I sort of went right through the League of Cities organization. Right. And I was like, huh, that's interesting, <laughs> you know. Right. Um, and so then even in uh, 2012, when the maps came out in 2011, I thought Allison Huber uh, would move into Rancho Cordova to run for assembly. Right. And, I, and I was all intent upon supporting her. And it was, I remember it was, I was on jury duty. I was in the parking structure at the Sacramento County Courthouse uh, on s- December 15th of 2011. And my phone rang and it was Allison Huber and she says, Ken, I'm not going to move. You, you should run. So I, that, that's when I said, okay, I, I am a middle of the road Democrat. I'm in a, a seat where there is no incumbent. Uh, I've established my reputation here for a decade. So yeah, I ran. And I, I guess that district back then was kind of a, a conservative district, right? Wasn't the previous assembly member a Republican seat or? Yeah. Uh, Yes, it was Alan Nakanishi before they redid the lines. Nakanishi, yep. And even before, uh, well, before her, it was Alan Nakanishi. Uh, it was, you know, she represented Rancho at the time. But, yeah, actually, when I got in in 2012, in January of 2012, it was like a 2% Democratic district. Mm-hmm. Which really, that's not even a Democratic district. That's right. What, because Democrats, honestly— can be sort of flaky. They don't always vote. Republicans tend to vote more like clockwork. But I know me. I'm a very, uh, I love going door to door. I right. talk with people. I've done that for decades. I still love going door to door. I've done it for 20 plus years. Um, you get fabulous conversations with somebody when they're when their foot's in their front room. Right. They'll tell you exactly what they think. It's <laughs> fabulous. Not shy. Yeah. Yeah, you know. Um, and, um, you know, I'm an Eagle Scout. I was a Scout Master. Uh, yeah, I've always felt this is even the new district is mm-hmm. a terrific district for me. Yeah, so Actually, how has your district changed from? Well, very distant areas like Harold, which is just outside Gall. Okay. And even Rancho Murrieta, which is not so far away, right. but is 20 plus miles, are no longer in the district. The new areas are Fol- uh, Folsom, Orangevale, and Fair Oaks. Well, I live not in Gold River, but in Sun River, just on the other side of Sunrise, the west side. So my neighborhood is against the parkway. So Fair Oaks, that's across the river. Right. Orange Vale, that's four miles away. And the most distant area of the city of Folsom is less than 12 miles from my home. And I've lived here for 45 years. Uh, I was... On my route to the leadership, statewide leadership of the league, I was president of Sacramento Valley Division of League of Cities. So I've been very active with Citrus Heights and Folsom uh, as a league officer over the years. Right. So it's sort of like, no, this is a, from my standpoint, this is this is kind of my stomping ground. I The Scoutmaster thing, I'm an Eagle Scout, and I've gone to Eagle Scout Courts of Honor for years, even before I was a member. Uh, an assembly member as an assembly member, I've done like 200 of them. And, um, it's almost like if there's any Eagle scout that young, young man or now woman who makes Eagle, uh, in Sacramento, whether in my district or not, I generally will get an invite Wow! because I, I know scouting and I typically do something kind of special Yeah, for an Eagle scout court of honor. I'll appear, I'll speak, but I, do some things that are sort of unique. That's great. You know, you spent so many years working in insurance uh, with the committee and private practice and so forth. You come to the assembly, you know, it only seemed natural that you would want to be the chair of insurance, but you didn't pick that. Uh, why? Yeah. Well, I felt um, that's right. It is like my long specialty. And when I describe how we build our careers by starting out as an accidental bystander, I'm really describing myself. Um, But I actually felt with my background, I ought to be able to be influential in the the insurance field without chairing the committee. Mm -hmm. I actually saw that in Lou Pappen, very influential without chairing the committee. 
And I definitely feel I'm an institution guy. So in a sense, I was interested in the rules committee as my original boss had chaired, because it's where you influence you know, the growth of young employees, set the standard for the institution, you convey the meaning of the institution to people. Um, so, and it was, it was a hard choice in one sense, Jarrett, under the assembly's rules, if you are even a member of rules, mm -hmm. much less the chair, you cannot chair a standing committee. So someone like me that had been in the institution for, by that point, 35 years, uh, involved with public policy, subject matter expert of my mm -hmm. own right, um, because I would fly around the U.S. and deal with insurance issues in other state capitals. Right. So I was more than just a California person. Uh, it, it was like I, I sort of took myself out of being the lead dog and in the subject matter I knew quite well. But it was also sort of my decision. It's like, okay, I know I know how the system works. And I the rules committee interested me. Right. And that was before... You know, it wasn't till Jerry Brown really talked about it in January 16 during Rich Gordon's tenure that the annex project got much visibility. And even then, and by 2017, I had excellent colleagues, excellent colleagues, they're not being mean, mm -hmm. who would look at me and smile and say, well, the annex project, that ain't happening. <laughs> you know. Right. Yeah. It's interesting. So... So you decide to become rules chair. You know, not many people ever talk about rules or know much about rules committee, but you know, I guess you had experience because Lou Pappen was rules chair. Right. So can you kind of tell us about rules committee, why you wanted to be the chair of rules and, and what's so great about the rules committee? What does the rules committee do for, for listeners who don't? Well, know? I mean, R rules committee is the employer of all the staff. So ultimately all hiring, firing is done by rules. So. You get elected as a member, you can come up with people you want to hire, but it has to go through rules. Mm. We do all the bill referrals. So I have a lawyer on my rules committee staff, but I literally go through each bill. I get stacks of bills. They have recommendations, but I, you know, I'm a lawyer and mm. I've done legislative work continuously for 45 years now. Uh, I, when I read bills, it's like, what's the, are we adding sections? Are we amending sections? Right. Where's the body of law? What's the subject matter? I'll scan through the body of the law, looking at what the changes are. Jared, it's amazing how often I'll read bills and I'll remember the debate that put that in the books in 1980. <laughs> I'll remember who was on the sides of that debate. Right. So, it's like um, seeing ghosts from the past. Huh? Yeah, totally. It's yeah. just, it's, it's like, um, uh, so I, I'm very interested in that. So I'm very engaged in right. bill assignments and um, and trying to kind of be fair and reasonable on, on how that's done. Um, and then there's things like, you know, definitely I have pushed oversight. And I, I started that before I was rules chair, but institutional oversight, very important function of the legislature. It's, it's kind of our superpower, but during term limits, it, it largely went away. Right. In the old days, far and away, the assembly was the most active body in oversight of the two. Once term limits hit and you had members coming in and out in six years, they rarely did oversight. It became budget committees did it, JLAC did it, and the accountability and, oversight and administrative review committee did it. But uh, so I see that as sort of this power of all of our standing committees mm. to engage in oversight. That's one of my big achievements is kind of a, off the radar, but uh, with senior staff under Tony Atkins, I developed a guide to oversight, uh, which is like that thick, how to do oversight, background resources for folks to use. And uh, then under Mr. Speaker, Anthony Rindon, we've actually put it online. So it's been online since uh, January or February of 2017. And now at NCOIL, I push oversight. Now I partner with the uh, uh, Carl Levin Center uh, out of Detroit, which does work on oversight. They've right. helped me. I'm also been instrumental in pushing oversight in CSG West, Council of State Governments West. So I'd say I'm sort of seen nationally as a leader in legislative oversight. 
which to me is a part of being a co-equal branch right. of government. When you, when you talk about legislative oversight, can you kind of specify kind of what, what you mean and kind of what, I guess, can you do in the Rules Committee via oversight? Are you talking to agencies? Are you talking to the legislature themselves? Or yeah. Different yeah, I would say the role of the rules chair is to support oversight mm -hmm. in, the, in the House. And it's done with the speaker, too, because the, you know, we pass the laws, but then we delegate them to these agencies to implement them. Right. So there could be questions on, on how we feel about how it's being administered. Um, just how's the law working? Over time, you know, nothing ever stands still. So there may be a question of whether a law that was passed in 1985 is still apt to the circumstances that agency or the public is facing today. If it assigns a high priority to an agency, is that the right priority now? So I think oversight is a way for the legislature to actually take the statutes out of the statute books, look at them, think about them in relation to the world in which they populate as members, what they know are the needs, and also just make sure agencies are doing the right thing. You know, it can be a, a constituent may send a letter saying something happened to me that was weird. And can you look into it? Right. Because oversight can start with a letter by a member to an agency. Can you explain this? Right. Uh, and it can be as formal as a full-on public hearing and sometimes subpoenaing witnesses. In my career, there were hearings we held where we actually subpoenaed witnesses. This is back in the Finance Insurance Committee during Pat Johnson's career. So I think being a sort of cheerleader and promoter for this as a power is definitely something I do. Right. Yeah. You know, I guess it's a it's an interesting time of year, and you've been around for a, a lot of end of sessions, and uh, it's probably changed quite a bit. Can you kind of talk about how these last end of sessions uh, uh, were in the past and how they compare to today and what you've noticed? Well, I think one obvious thing in a week when it's been regularly above the 100-degree mark, uh, anybody who's hanging out in the Capitol trying to make their final arguments with people a rover in the swing space, and there's plenty of seating and the air conditioning works. Plenty of charging, yeah. You know, we haven't actually, you, you remember being in or outside 3191 right. in August during crunch time when it's just it's so hot. Mm -hmm. The hallway, yeah. Oh, my gosh. So we, we don't have that. But it's, uh, yeah, you know, uh, the state capital is it's like the hub of a wheel. Every spoke, every issue converges on the California State Capitol and they all ramp up at the end. Mm -hmm. All the issues have been brewing, kind of like the napkin deal. People have ideas, but are, are they gonna land there that particular plan? Are they gonna find a way to bring it together? Um, so all of that activity is going on. Um, it is interesting, you know, you remarked, oh yeah, so many office buildings are empty. But, you know, the nature of the legislature institution, it, it is about people coming together. And, you know, the Senate doesn't say that, but the name of my house actually says it, assembly. The way we govern ourselves is, is you do let people come together and engage in conversation. We are getting past COVID, which was highly disruptive of that. Right. But, uh, you know, there is a human chemistry at the core of legislative process where it sometimes takes getting in the room with people and, you know, you say what you think and you get the blowback from that other person because they see it differently. Mm -hmm. And then as righteous as you felt in your view, you realize, well, there actually probably is sort of a middle ground here, which is that Robert's rule of order idea, right. you know? Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's just, it, it, it's how we, how we do things. And it does have a more normal feel even though we're shuttling back and forth between the swing space and the chamber, you know, the historic wing. Um, it's, yeah, it, it's just when everyone starts doing their fine calculations at this point of the year, you know. You may see issues, you may think you want to be someplace, you may know what you want, but, but then when the pieces start coming together, you start getting out your pencil and, Figuring out, okay, does this, you know, how do I feel about this? Right. Um, you know, some, something I've noticed, especially this year in general, is, you know, you used to see a lot more end of session gut amends. 
Um, and I, I bet you saw a lot more yeah. 30 or 40 years ago yeah. than you did 10 years ago. And you definitely see a lot less today than you did 10 years ago. Uh, kind of as, as rules chair who, you know, all these gut amends would come through you. Yeah. Uh, kind of what, what are you noticing and kind of why do you think that's changed? Well, I think the, um, you know, I've always viewed our capital process as sort of in a fishbowl, but I think the rise of social media, the internet, uh, there, there's a lot more visibility on the process and that's not a bad thing. Right. Um, you know, the 72 hour print rule, there's, that also pushes conversations along earlier. Um, I think guts and amends just, they, they have sort of a, a, more of a negative stigma than, than maybe they once had. Um, and it's also the case that um, when I started my legislative career, you saw much greater use of the conference committee mechanism. The, the budget conference committee? No, no, conference committees on any given bill. Okay, interesting. So, you know, uh, Senator Blondin brings a bill back from the assembly and the assembly did something to it you didn't like, mm -hmm. you could make a motion to non-concur. You could ask your body to not agree to those amendments. And then that would throw it into a conference mechanism. Oh, interesting where you'd have uh, three members from each house that would convene to talk about the bill. And in fact, uh, it would be, uh, there, there was actually, this was very routine. So you'd have a lot of conference committees late in session happening on bills all over the building. And um, sometimes out of those, you could do a re major rewrite of the bill. You see it as a gut and amend, but it comes out of this conference process. Uh, yeah, conference committees were, oh my gosh, they were a staple. This could be a whole show. What rules do we no longer use or know about that could be helpful with Ken? Well, I tell you, <laughs> conference committees are 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 a, a good mechanism. I think they've fallen into disrepute because people feel they're a little too much change can happen. Right. But actually, it's it's in the modern context of much more transparency. It is a way to let the two houses work together and find mm -hmm. a, a more of a landing place instead of you're just take it or leave it. Right. And that's kind of, I, I don't think anybody knows about this rule, Ken, because yeah. I've had situations uh, recently where we've discussed such a thing about how, well, if they change it, then it, and then all you can do is concur. The committee chair can't bring it back in his uh, Yeah. No, conference committee. committees were... Oh gosh, they happen all the time in, in the old days. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it always included people that liked the bill and people didn't support the bill. Right. So it's, uh, you know, at core, a lot of the legislative process, you end up figuring out who you trust on, on some level among your colleagues to be sort of an honest broker or whatever the view is. Right. And so you can say a lot of things about the conference committee, but with 120 members all busy, you know, you put a uh, a bill lock here and uh, a uh, Newt Russell, who's a pretty conservative senator uh, and always objected if amendments were non-germane, and uh, uh, Roseanne Vujic mm -hmm. on a conference committee, you know, the, people will feel, okay, it's going to be pretty well represented right. on our side. He, the process already works with a great deal of deference to people you, you you decide who you trust to be the lead dog. And the cops committee just gives us you another way to do that, to kind of have people that you know are in the mix, sort of know you know their personalities, right. how they approach issues. You know, one thing I'd say every everybody ought to know is um personally, I think any bill we pass with a new agency should include a statutory requirement that if the legislature asks for information, they need to provide it. Uh, we have a great joint rule that says agencies have to share information with the legislature. But for a variety of reasons, the way the laws evolved under court decision, it's kind of unenforceable, strictly speaking. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's unfortunate. We ought to go back in that direction um, and uh, always include that in our statutory requirements. Um, and... Uh, I, I'm also someone to feel like if you've got an important issue that you think's good, you ought to do, uh, pass a bill to set up a joint committee. 
make it something that's set out in the government code because they end up having more clout right. than just doing it by the house rules. No, interesting. It, it Random seems like, ideas. You know, uh, you know, what, I, I had the pleasure of, of working on the floor unit under under Lou Leary and just the oh, kind yeah, right, of the, yeah. the institutional knowledge on the floor with Dotson and all that and, and and everyone knowing the rules and you know you'd see members I, I think the last member I knew who would object to something would be uh, Ian Calderon's dad um, he, yeah, he knew the yeah. rules so well yeah, yeah. kind of what what have you seen you know I guess in your last what twelve years being on the floor uh, kind of a the rules not not I'm just being, in year ten right I, I can serve two more but anyway <laughs> right, right, yeah. Right. Uh, I guess the rules not being a, a, at the forefront. You know, you don't see really uh, members objecting to amendments not being germane and things like that. Well, I think this is uh, it, this is just the impact of term limits. Mm -hmm. Members, you know, my class of 2012 come up, we're much more focused on sort of the bill process. And um, it, it's like truly to walk off the street in the legislative process as a new member under term limits you're walking into this hall of wonders. Right. It's just very bewildering. And um, yeah, I think uh, it's, yeah, it's something that has been lost, just the learning curve, you know. People didn't like, you know, we got term limits because they didn't like Willie Brown was speaker for 14 years. But they forget actually, yeah. It was only know. 14 years, it seemed, yeah. seemed way longer. Yeah, <laughs> but he was a member Right. For 18 years okay. before he became speaker for 14 years. So you go back to the old days, you had members that were just, they, they had been in the institution decades. That could be good, that could be bad, but it actually means, you know, the legislature is actually often referred to as the first branch of government mm -hmm. because we are the people's branch. And like this idea of oversight, you know, Who's going to hold the executive branch agencies accountable if not the legislature? Right. The public actually needs strong members who will stand up for their constitutional standing. And um, it's a huge responsibility to dump on people when they're just walking off the street and, you know, trying to figure out where the bathrooms are. Right. You know, and they've... They, they, they don't know the process. So, you know, I, I would say when you look at my time as rules chair pre-COVID, once a month I would just do like a brown bag lunch with any staff that wanted to come around. Mm -hmm. And it was just my way of kind of being accessible, talking about careers, promoting careers, talking about professionals in the process, because that to me was a way to kind of strengthen the institution. Right. Um, the The whole oversight thing which I got jumped into early. So as I say, I became a member in 13 and by the by 15, I had a draft oversight guide that actually Tony Atkins first put out with Rich Gordon as chair uh, of rules. You know, I'm very interested in this issue of just how do you, how do you short cycle the development of staff, members, institution? Uh, even the Annex Project has, has always had as a principal goal I always quote Churchill who said, we shape our institutions, therefore they shape us. That idea that you, you shape our building, therefore it shapes you. The biggest expression of that idea is trying to have space in the new building so assembly committees can come back into the building. Mm -hmm. Because uh, if a member comes off the street and they are now chairing a committee, the goal is actually to grow them to be a strong chair, knowledgeable in the subject matter, sort of a good able to manage that subject matter on behalf of the body and the legislature and the people. And it's harder to do if your committee's a block away. Right. You know, I watched Pat Johnston as chair of the F&I committee. He would go to lunch and have an interesting conversation and he'd be, he'd poke his head in the committee office, say, hey, I just heard this and such, what do you know about that? And staff would say, I actually don't know anything about that, but I'll, can I come by this afternoon and kind of right. fill you in? That's what you want. That's what makes you, you, you get something like that back in the building and let that play out over time. Every chair will be much more influential. And I think that's, you know, the public may not like politicians, but they actually prefer to have the elected lawmaker driving the policy train 
than staff or some other right. group. Yeah, because yeah. I guess they can ultimately hold you accountable. Yeah, totally. Right. Yeah, well, and and you know, you you've taken that oath of office. Mm. You know. Yeah. So, um, you know, you've been elected with the president of the National Council of Insurance Legislators. Is that is that correct? Right? Yes, National Council of Insurance Legislators. You know, in our nation, insurance law insurance is regulated at the state level. Mm -hmm. A lot of the day to day is done by an insurance commissioner, either appointed or elected in most states. But basically, that job they are a code administrator. They administer the law of insurance as set forth in the code books of the fifty states. That means it's actually very important to have state lawmakers who are familiar with their state law and current issues in insurance in case the law needs any tweaking. It's like, that's our job. Right. It's that oversight, even in the operational law. So NCOIL has been around for 50 years. It's the National Council of Insurance Legislators. It is comprised of lawmakers in the 50 states who specialize in, in the subject matter of insurance. We get together several times a year to kind of get briefed on what's current issues. We meet regularly with the leadership of the Nat National Association of Insurance Commissioners. So we're not just off doing our thing. We're actually right. talking to the regulators uh, at every one of our meetings. We have them in the room. But we're getting directly briefed on, on key issues. And uh, so very bipartisan. And honestly, it's, it's more of a Republican organization than Democrat, though it's anymore it's pretty close. Right. But... Uh, yeah, I got active. I first was first involved in NQL because Lou Pappen was active in NQL in the 70s. When I was at Pat Johnson in the 1980s, I actually attended NQL meetings on behalf of the assembly. Uh, but as a member, I immediately got active in NQL. And uh, my colleagues from around the country uh, selected me as president. So I'm serving as president of NQL. And, and what's that? You know, I guess it's it's been a interesting few years for insurance like here in california we had all the fires and, you know you had all the insurance housing issues i guess it's like just constantly involving with with issues though uh you know we had covid and i'm sure that affected medical insurance yeah, yeah. and then we have this you know inflation issues and you know a lot of insurance is also investment yeah. um so kind of what are some of the the things that are are top of mind for the insurance agencies this year and kind of causing issues um well the, the whole gamut i think uh Insurance is a very complicated business and it's based upon trying to analyze risk. Mm. And um, just, I would say there is a continual need in the insurance business to just continually educate people on how insurance works, uh, to understand how, how, how the businesses operate. There are issues of the global insurance system really after Dodd-Frank, we, we become much more international in the way the insurance business operates. And so we get in conversations at the state level with global regulators who are concerned about how our system operates. And um, so we get active on those sorts of things. There are issues of, you know, a lot more people have pets during COVID. Sydney and I, we, we have a COVID right. dog. The, the, the world's summer. changed. Yeah. Yeah. You know. And, and an issue that's very important to a lot of people is if I got a German Shepherd or a pit bull with the sweetest temperament mm -hmm. that has never acted violent towards anybody, are they excluded from my homeowner's policy if, you know, if they've never right. done anything? Uh, you get issues like that. There continue to be issues of how you pay for medical transportation around the country. Uh, you know, people tend to be more mobile. They're getting more mobile. I issues of how that works. Cost of pharmaceuticals is a big issue in the insurance industry as it is everywhere here in California, right. but nationally. Yeah, all of these issues are kicking around. Um, you know, the rise of uh, DoorDash and Uber and Lyft. And we've sort of dealt with a lot of those things in California, but these are Still, right. issues kicking around. What about the the decline of, of diving boards and water slides and swimming pools? What has insurance done to that? And how can we bring <laughs> diving boards back to swimming pools, Ken? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> well, I think that's, uh, yeah, I just think that's that's probably as much the lawyers as anybody else. Oh, and yeah. I wear that hat too, right, you know. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the, uh, 
Yeah. Our system of liability is is kind of red, red hot. Right. You know, we passed a bill, Mr. Grayson presented on the floor, the Bill Dodd bill to raise minimum limits on auto insurance mm. um, because our minimum limits have been pretty low. And it passed off the floor yesterday. We, there was at least a few members that opposed it. You know, even something like that, which seems like there seems a good argument that you ought to have better coverage. I supported Mr. Dodd in that bill, but I also recognize that uh, the, the issue has always been to make sure insurance products are affordable for right. folks that don't have much money. Because if it's not affordable to folks who don't have much money, then that's going to increase the level of uninsured motorists. And that hurts everyone else who's buying insurance. Exactly. Because when you get hit by somebody who has no insurance, then... You know, so that, no, that's uh, that's an issue that um, is lurking in a bill like that. Mm -hmm. And you sort of got to understand the system and, um, you know, to see it. In that case, I did very well for two and a half years, but then I did eventually get COVID. And uh, I do sit on the insurance committee, but that bill, there was a number of bills that went through uh, – on, in that when I was out with COVID, mm -hmm. that was one of them. Uh, but anyway, I guess, I guess this year we had kind of a big deal in the insurance world, right? We had a medical malpractice cap rates uh, rise. You know, that's something that's what been been brewing for what 30, 30 40 yeah, years. Yeah, it goes back. The micro, <laughs> the micro deal went back to just before I arrived in Sacramento in nineteen seventy five, um, and uh, yeah, it's totally that was an issue about. The cost of medical care, mm -hmm. uh, how lawsuits operate. It, it, it's sort of like your diving board issue, right. scaled up to big money issues affecting uh, the delivery of health care. But yeah, it had been capped for a long, long time. And uh, there was an effort to maybe push a ballot measure to try to change it. Right. And as so many of those have played out in recent years, they ended up kind of deciding on, let's go with a bill uh, that would represent a compromise in its own way, kind of like the napkin deal. It's actually a good example right. for a conversation that started with the napkin deal and put in a bill and stand down the hostilities at the ballot box and uh, you know, save a hundred or $150 million, not public dollars, but you know, th those, those fights get very expensive very fast. No, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Um, Speaking of, of great question, thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. no worries, no worries. Uh, coming down, I guess in, into this end of session, kind of what what kind of bills do you have on your own in your legislative package, and kind of what what are you looking to kind of achieve this year as a member? Well, um, I I have bills dealing with uh, the pension system. I'm sort of a specialist in that. Mm -hmm. I've never chaired that committee, but. Uh, I've worked on pension issues since the 1980s. Not, not dissimilar from insurance. Yeah, in right. Ways, yeah. In the 80s, actually, the assembly sent me to the Wharton School of Business to get some training in pension stuff. So I've sort of been active there for a long time. Um, yeah, I, uh, you know, it's an interesting thing. For all my experience, you know, if there's a wistfulness about my career, Pretty cool to be a state legislator. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Jared, most lawmakers come to Sacramento and they get to pick their endeavors. They want to do this. They want to do that. That's right. what they do. You know, I authored a lot more bills early in my career until I became rules chair and then this whole project across the street got right. going. That became sort of the endeavor that picked me. It's like as improbable as progress on that would seem, if it's going to happen, it's up to me. Right. And uh, I share with you my key fob, which has. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why don't you, why don't you tell the listeners about that? Yeah. Uh, when I became joint rules chair in January 17, it meant I was supposed to work on this annex project, which everyone in their right mind thought would never happen. Right. But Arnold had studied the building early. Jerry started the funding under my predecessor. So it's like it's, it's on me. So I started meeting weekly with a handful of staff and I would always tell them, I had two expressions, all good things in life have to proceed through three words, I'd say, impossible, improbable, inevitable. Mm -hmm. 
And as to this project, I felt my job as chair was every day to kind of say, is there something I can do to today that I didn't do yesterday to kind of move it along that continuum? Uh, the other expression was just, there comes a time when you got to start revving the motor and put the car into gear. Right. Kind of the same idea. How do you, how do you move this along? So, uh, yeah, I, even now, I am very focused on just what does it take to move this along? At this point, it's, it is moving. But the most important thing for the taxpayers of California mm -hmm. at this juncture is that the project be done at an early date. Because the longer it drags out, the more it will cost. Right. That's just construction reality. Uh, to that end, I did some out-of-the-box work early on. I went to the another national organization, the National Council of State Legislatures, NCSL, mm -hmm. in... 2016 even, and said, who do you know that it has worked on capital rebuilds? Because I'd like to see what I could learn from them. And they gave me the name of someone out of uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, a guy named David Hart, who actually surprisingly was instrumental and has been instrumental in the rebuilds of the Utah State Capitol, the Minnesota State Capitol, and now the Wyoming State Capitol, on time and on budget. So there's an interesting uh, career specialty, right. rebuilding public capitals. And so he's actually helping us on our project. Yeah. And uh, so I just feel like, well, I'll be termed out. You know, I'm on the ballot in November, so it's up to the voters to decide if I continue to serve in a public role or not. Assuming I do, I'm termed out in two years. The project I expect will be done in the fall of 25. I still hold out hope, Jarrett, that we will do a some form of ceremonial celebration of the new state capitol, which will be largely done by then, on, I'll say it here with you, September 9th, 2025, which will be the 175th anniversary of the founding of California. Wow. It's admission state. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'd like to have a party on Admissions Day 2025 to celebrate the new building. That would be when I'm closing out my, uh, it'd be, just, I'd already be done. After session ended. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Session will just have ended. I'll have been gone by 24, but I think I can, you know, I'll have it well underway. It's already right. well launched. Yeah. So yeah, the, it's already all well launched. You got uh, fences around, you got a lot of construction going on. Kind of, can you tell us kind of what's going on right now, construction wise and, and what can we expect? And I guess the next six months like i guess we're all expecting like you know this big demolition to happen like yeah. a dynamite thing and all yeah kind of implodes you'll, down. you'll never see that and i do need to say huh. uh the project was sued but that's actually resolving itself and mm -hmm. department of general services they did the sequa analysis and the attorney general is managing our litigation mm -hmm. so it's not something we're doing in-house we're using t expert people to assist right. in that I think that will resolve itself. They'll never see a big explosion over there. The annex sits too close to the historic wing, so it will be very carefully removed, starting on the inside, and then particularly where it abuts the west wing, very right. carefully dismantled, so there's no impact on that structure. I think that will happen in the first quarter of next year. They'll start seeing that. All the work right now, um, the two buildings, based upon when they were built, and both 52 and then the rebuild that finished in 82 had a lot of systems that were integrated. Right. You and can just so, tell that by walking the floors, right? And, and so <laughs> all the work you see now is what we call enabling work. Mm -hmm. It's the work that's necessary to actually get the project site ready for go on the main project. So a lot of preparation for that. It's also disconnecting the two buildings so that there's no interference in the legislative operations. So yeah, all the stuff we see now is in this category of enabling work. Mm -hmm. And it's really just bringing us to the launching moment when, you know, we can rock and roll. The one contribution I did with Mr. Hart was I always told him, uh, Mr. Hart, if you come to work for us, you know, you need to view this project because of this impact on taxpayers if it's delayed. You need to think of this, it's like D-Day, baby, right. I said to him, you know, Eisenhower had to make sure everything was assembled 
for that day, that assault on Fortress Europe. So everything could go because there was always going to be more that needed to go and you couldn't waste time. You had to be ready to right. rock and roll. That's how you need to manage this for us. And ultimately that's good for taxpayers. I'm, uh, that's how it's being managed. I think that's how it will unfold. I do want to give kudos to the legislature and the governor. Early on in this process, we had cash, COVID hit, our revenues collapsed. We set up a bond funding mechanism, which would have added almost a half billion dollars in interest expense to the project. And it's not so prominent to people, but very much I was advocating that with all those revenues, it would be a, almost a scandal to pay, to borrow funds to rebuild the state capital right. when cash saves a half billion dollars. So uh, this last year's budget set aside the cash for the project. You know, our, our state capital is definitely one of the more, more beautiful state capitals in, in the uh, United States. And I think it's one of three state capitals that actually looks like the, the U.S. capital. Yeah. yeah. Um, architecturally, how are you, I guess, kind of saving the historic parts and kind of, I guess, you know, adding adding the annex? Like, how do, how do you thread that needle? Well, you know, there's the interesting thing about our state capital. There is so much symbolism all around the building. Right. And there's actually a law that was added back in 2018 that says we have to kind of bring some of that symbolism back in the building. It's odd that the annex never picked up the symbolism. The most ubiquitous symbol all over the capital is a bundle of sticks. Mm -hmm. It has pineapples and all the wooden staircases. So yeah, I brought some of that. Uh, so there's a sense of hospitality, which is symbolized by the pineapple, the bundle of sticks. You see that in most- Is that what the pineapple means? The pineapple is hospitality, totally. Is that why it was brought into the speaker's office when you guys were meeting? Yeah, it, yeah, it, it's it's. Uh, okay, here's the the bundle of sticks with the pineapple. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So the idea, you know, the, the oh. building was built before you had electricity. Right. So if you're walking around the building, you would pass those pineapples on the right. staircase. Because in the 1860s, if someone came to your home in California and you served them pineapple. It was astonishing hospitality. Oh, interesting. So it's a public building. I always thought those were pine cones. Those are pine yeah, apples. no, they're, okay. they're pineapples. Bundle of sticks, you would see that in most American state capitals. It's the idea we take individuals, any one of whom is brittle, fine people. Right. But they collectively, we work on government. You know, and the idea is we're going to have a visitor center out on the west side. And I anticipate it will have a skylight that will let you see the portico above right. as you enter. And Jared, I'm gonna bet most of the people that are listening here, all, all half dozen of them, uh, <laughs> would not know that there's an allegory in stone on the West Portico. But when you go back over there and you look up at the building, yeah. on the left-hand side, there's a very weird statue to have on the state capitol. Mm -hmm. It's a grizzly bear attacking a rider on horseback. Right. On the right-hand side, that's now a buffalo attacking a woman holding a baby also on horseback. So you have these very violent statues up on the West Portico. Right. It's like, what's that all about? And the key to the whole allegory is below it, you got the portico, that's the triangular piece. Athena stands there with her lance and her shield. Mm -hmm. She's flanked by two women on either side. They represent education, culture, uh, community. Right. And the key to the whole tableau is wrapped around her feet is a subdued grizzly bear. Okay, yeah. So the message of the West Portico, which is kind of like COVID, but in life, when they built this building, they had this sense that in life, for people, there's always times when something very bad comes upon you out of the blue. And then it becomes the job of government with the community to deal with it. Right. It's actually a pretty great statuary group to have on the state mm. capitol. No, that's, that's fascinating. all the issues come there. I Most people look there, don't know it's, don't know that story. Oh, totally. Something. Like you pointed out the bundle of sticks to me a couple of years ago, and now I see it everywhere. Yeah. Uh, now I'm going to start seeing these pineapples everywhere too. Yeah, yeah, indeed. <laughs> so, great. yeah, so that's kind of, it's, yeah, to me, I just think it's the new building will be mm -hmm. subordinate to the historic capital. Right. It's that, that's an important part of it. I anticipate that down where today there's parking, uh, we'll have a campus of hearing rooms so that on a bad day, if something happened, people could vacate the hearing room level just straight into the park. They wouldn't have to 
get down off an upper floor. Right. So that's actually better for people. Um, since 1952, actually, you couldn't start at 15th and walk past the building or start at 10th and walk past the building all the way to 15th because it was darn driveways. Right. That blocked you. So we really hindered enjoyment of Capitol Park by those driveways. This project, those driveways will be gone. A school group could land, uh, you know, right in front of the West Wing and, and walk the length of the park right by the building, go down to 15th, come back. So we will actually, this project will reopen the enjoyment of Capitol Park. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think most people quite, quite grasp that, you know, the legacy of the state Capitol, Grand Capitol Park is going to be restored by this project. No, that's great. I guess if, if our listeners want to, I guess, find out more information about the the project and its status, and I guess what renderings you guys have renderings on a website. Yeah, like they that? just if they just look, if they just Google yeah. Annex, uh, Cap California Annex Project, we've had a website about this project that has been up online on the Assembly's website uh, since the spring of 2017. It's been up for more than five years, so they can find a lot right there and they can explore the tabs uh yeah there's a lot of material we've conducted multiple right. hearings 2017 18 19 21 yeah, it, it's 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 actually been a pleasure uh following you on twitter uh kind of talking with alex vassar and uh uh the real assemblyman kind of historically and you've posted a couple photos of yourself uh, and your haircut has remained the same for the past 40 years, Ken. So yeah. that was one of the most amazing things I saw. I was like, wow, Ken looks the same, you know, 40 years ago as he does today. <laughs> it's, uh, I, I, I have to say this, you know, it's like, um, I think the marvelous thing for me is obviously, as I say, little government geek, mm -hmm. right in J JFK when I'm eight years old. Right. But I'm not jaded. I like what I do. I believe in the process. I definitely feel that, um, you know, when the when the annex was built in the 50s, people with grievous injuries, loss of limbs, they didn't come to the Capitol. It was not hospitable to them. Right. You know, now we have people who have motorized wheelchairs, they have exceptional mobility, but getting in the Capitol's hard. The elevators are not well oh, conducive yeah. of that. The bathrooms are not conducive to that person. So, you know, it's the people's house. Right. And it will be a people's house in a different way, a more welcoming way for the longest time. Getting committees back in the building will mean that, you know, someone's clients come up here for a day on the hill, they'll be able to talk to the members, talk to the committee in the same building, only have to go right. to security once. Uh, it's, yeah, it'll be good. Yeah. Different. I, th I think, you know, the most interesting uh, takeaway from, from my conversation to you uh, today is, is that, you know, often members feel defined by the legislation they carry. And, you know, you've kind of proved that it's not necessarily the bills you carry, it's the impact you can have on the House and, and your work on the, the annex and being a subject matter expert and kind of affecting Oversight, change, yeah. Yeah, indirectly is is uh, is amazing. And, uh, yeah, you. I totally felt, I, mean, I thank you for that. I, that's how I see myself. I no. mean, the issue of oversight came right out of Greg Schmidt, actually. When I was back in the Senate doing insurance in mm -hmm. 2009, Greg asked if anyone had anything on the topic of oversight. I wrote my first little brief little paper on that for Greg Schmidt when he right. was Secretary of the Senate. That sort of got me realized, well, I do have something to say on this topic, and I just kept developing it. Right. And then uh, I set the goal uh, to get something online, and it took me seven years to get it online. Uh, I finally got online in 2017. By then it was much more robust, but then I didn't stop there. I carried it to CSG West. They now have a, a handbook on oversight, right. which I was one of the co-chairs of the effort that led that along with the current Lieutenant Governor of Utah, a uh, Republican. And then as I say, Incoil, that's been clearly one of my top priorities. And now I partner uh, with uh, yeah, the Detroit Law School because uh, Carl Levin, for 36 years in the U.S. Senate, did a lot mm -hmm. of oversight. So. I, I guess, you know, just one, one last question before we go. You know, you worked for Lou Papin all those years. Here we have his daughter coming in the assembly. <clears throat> kind of what's that like and what, what's that going to be like next year, you know, when you're serving with your old boss uh, daughter in yeah. the same chamber? Well, I'm going to look forward to that. I support Diane. I think she'll be an excellent member. I think she'll be, you know, like me, she comes mm -hmm. out of local government. Like me, she's an attorney. 
Um, and uh, she was young, but she will remember so many members mm -hmm. in a firsthand sort of way. Tom Bain, Marlene Bain, his wife. Um, you know, yeah. Uh, Bruce Young, Willie, of course, right. Leo McCarthy. Yeah, she will bring a different sense to the institution because, um, you know, the I totally believe the people of California need members of stature to uh, sort of be independent and figure out what they think. Right. And uh, – I think she will bring a level of understanding of the office that uh, I believe she will display it in her own conduct once she gets settled here. Mm. But also she won't be buffaloed by people who think a member should be something different. Right. Um, yeah, Lou Pappen was a very exceptional member. You know, he would be described as the enforcer. The great B.T. Collins, who once represented the area I represent in eastern Sacramento County, uh, lost an arm and a leg in Vietnam, mm -hmm. famous for drinking down the Malathion uh, during the 1981 Medfly crisis. Uh, he had a nickname for Lou Pappen, whom he, he loved Lou Pappen, but his nickname was Thug. <laughs> uh, Pappen could be very direct. Right. I mean, I, I said he got that veto override, but... As you know, when we draft a bill, it gets jacketed. And you have to sign the jacketed version put across the desk. Right. And on that jacket, there's a line for every member of the legislature. Well, typically, a member would just have the staff do a letter to the 119. Do you want to call it this bill? If yes, sign it, tear the thing off, send right. it back in. Wrong. That's how we did things in the old days. Not Lou Pappen, not on the bill he wanted to get an override for. He wanted that jacketed bill. And he carried it around the hallways mm -hmm. and buttonholed people. I said, Lou, why, why aren't I drafting a letter? It's easy to do. You're a busy guy. And it's very revealing. He says, no, no. I want to see who can say no to my face. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, there weren't many who could say no to his yeah. face because when he introduced the bill, he had 99 other signatures on his mm -hmm. bill jacket. And honestly, he just wanted to get it introduced. Right. He didn't want to dally any longer. And that actually is a part of the strategy, just to point out. If you want to, if you have an issue that you think you're going to try to get an override, you have to do what Luke Pappen had the smarts to do. He got it introduced. He moved it through the whole process by end of May. The whole process. So it could go to the governor. And Jerry had 12 days. And then he had to act, and that meant that the legislature was sitting right there in right. chambers Ready to, to respond. Go. Didn't wait till the end of the year. So it's, there's a whole level of to exercise the power of this office does take an understanding of how to exercise power and, and how to work within the framework of the institution. So those are very valuable lessons for me as a young guy to work with a member like that. Um, I'm not Lou Pappen, but... Uh, one of the treasured moments in my career, late in my career, uh, I was in the sixth floor cafeteria with Lou Pappen, and he was just discussing what I was doing and that sort of thing. And I was remarking, Lou, you were you force of nature. We're, I'm acknowledging who he was. Right. He says, yeah. Kenny says, but you're kind. He said, you're the kindest man in the building, and kindness is strength, says Right. Lou Pappen, thug and force the yin and the yang, force uh, of right. nature. So, uh, yeah, I, I, the hair may be the same. I hope the person is the same. <laughs> no, definitely. Well, it was a pleasure talking with you, Ken. Always learn something new, uh, chatting with you. So great. And, uh, definitely uh, some great pearls of wisdom here. Well, and of course, uh, the Blondian family has been a part of my life for a long time. So I'm very uh, delighted to be here. Definitely. Well, yeah. thank you so much, Ken. Yeah. Great talking with you. Yeah. All right.